And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood, every man in his place, round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. They were farmers and backwoodsmen, settlers determined to carve out a livelihood in the forests and mountains of the Carolinas. Before 1780, the Patriot cause had been of little effect or concern to these people. But as a British army under Lord Charles Cornwallis swept all colonial resistance before them, these settlers were forced to take sides and fight to defend their homes and churches from attack. At King's Mountain, they came together and dealt the British a stunning defeat which propelled the American cause to the eventual victory at Yorktown. With the war in the North becoming bogged down by 1779, British commander Sir Henry Clinton sought to shift the war into the more vulnerable southern colonies of Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. It was hoped the milder winters and strong Loyalist support would enable Clinton's forces to regain control of the South, Savannah, Georgia, fell before New Year's Eve, 1779. The British armies surrounded and besieged Charleston by the end of March, 1780, and in May, American General Benjamin Lincoln surrendered over 5,000 men and a host of artillery, ships, and small arms, leaving the Carolinas defenseless. A violent encounter between Colonel Bannister Tarleton's dragoons and fleeing American troops at the Waxhaws quickly rallied the countryside against the British, however. With over 100 dead, stories of British brutality against soldier and civilian began to spread. Local bands of Patriot militia began to engage British patrols and Loyalist militias in skirmishes. However, the Continental Army suffered a serious setback at the Battle of Camden in August of 1780. American General Horatio Gates' army was routed with the militia on his flank giving gave way, allowing Cornwallis to win the day. However, this defeat did nothing to calm the militia and settlers in the backcountry. These farmers and settlers lived by a combination of farming and raising livestock in the wilderness. British successes, like the burning of churches and crops, only ignited the embers of civil war as the British openly recruited and armed Tory militia under the command of Major Patrick Ferguson. Patrick Ferguson was a former officer of the 71st Highland Regiment, who was assigned to the role of raising and training the Loyalist militia. Born on June 4, 1744, at Pitfor in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, Ferguson was a nobleman who had seen combat in the colonies since 1777 under the leadership of Sir Henry Clinton. He was a seasoned officer who had been in the British Army since the age of 15. A force of almost 1,000 militia and provincial regulars set out under Ferguson for the mountain settlements, openly proclaiming his intention to carry fire and sword in the frontier. The foremost colonial opponent to Ferguson's move was Colonel Benjamin Cleveland, a respected frontier fighter in North and South Carolina. Cleveland possessed a great deal of weight and authority amongst the Patriot settlers in the backcountry. Another voice of resistance to Ferguson's intent was John Sevier. He was amongst the most noteworthy of the King's Mountain veterans. At times an outlaw, Sevier would continue to combat Indians on the frontier. Other notable leaders to form militia bands included William Campbell from Virginia, Joseph McDowell, who had ties to the Overmountain men, Frederick Hambright, also from Virginia, James Williamson, Jacob Shelby, and Joseph Winston. Even as over mountain men and militia began to gather and prepare to challenge Ferguson, Ferguson continued to bluster, even as he fell back towards Charlotte and the safety of Cornwallis's army. The Patriot forces gathered at Quaker Meadows at the end of September, intent on trapping Ferguson and destroying his small army. His open threats against their homes and families gave them no other option but to wipe him out. 
The Patriot forces were lightly equipped, carrying a rifle, ammunition, and a small amount of food. They had no formal command structure. Rather, each band's appointed leader worked in concert with the others. Before they left their gathering place, a preacher, Samuel Doak, gave the troops his benediction, preaching to them from Judges chapter 7, speaking of Gideon's victory against the Midianites. Their rallying cry that day became, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Believing King's Mountain to be a defensible location, Ferguson wrote to Cornwallis begging for reinforcements. I am on my march toward you by a road leading from Cherokee Ford, north of King's Mountain. Three or four hundred good soldiers, part dragoons, would finish the business. Something must be done. This is the last push in this quarter. His vaguely worded request never arrived in time. The militia and mountaineers were upon him before help could arrive. On the afternoon of October 8, 1780, the partisans surrounded the ridge. Many were seasoned Indian and frontier fighters, and the orders they were given showed how they would fight against the Tories. Colonel Isaac Shelby from Kentucky, who later became the governor, told his men prior to the battle, When we encounter the enemy, don't wait for the award of command. Let each of you be your own officer, and do the best you can, taking every care you can of yourselves, and availing yourselves of every advantage that chance may throw your way. As the Patriots attacked, they fired from behind the cover of tree trunks, thinning the Tory ranks with well-aimed shots as they stood in ranks at the crest. Each British counterattack became bogged down by the withering fire of the Wiggle militiamen. Shelby, in the thick of the fighting, told his men, Now, boys, quickly, load your rifles and let's advance and give them another hell of fire. With his ranks disintegrating, Ferguson attempted to rally his troops, but was shot from his horse, leaving his surviving force without leadership. What remained of the Tory militia that Cornwallis had been counting on to maintain order in the Carolinas surrendered, having suffered severe casualties. In total, some 221 Tories were killed, with 163 wounded, and over 700 captured. On the Patriot side, a mere 28 men had been killed, and some 62 had been wounded. American Partisan General Davidson, writing to General Sumner. Ferguson, the great partisan, has miscarried. The Tories in the region continued to fight back, however, even after this defeat. Patriot General Nathaniel Green, upon hearing of the out outright animosity between Whigs and Tories, stated, There is not a day passes, but there are more, or less, who fall a sacrifice to the savage disposition. The Whigs seem determined to extirpate the Tories, and the Tories the Whigs. Some thousands have fallen in this way, and the evil rages with more violence than ever. If a stop cannot be put to these massacres, the country will be depopulated in a few months more. Fresh leadership following the Patriot victory at King's Mountain served to take advantage of the momentum gained there. General Nathaniel Green, sent to command the American forces in the region, sought to keep Cornwallis off balance. The British would be forced to react to American movements, not the other way around. A force under American General Daniel Morgan ambushed and destroyed Tarleton's British Legion at Cowpens in January of 1781. Cornwallis aggressively pursued Green and attacked his army at Guilford Courthouse two months later. Although Cornwallis won the day, his army was so badly bloody that he was forced to retreat northward and invade Virginia. Bottled up at Yorktown in October of 1781, Cornwallis was forced to surrender, thereby ending the war and forcing the British government to sue for peace.
As complete as Yorktown was, it would not have been possible without the turning points of King's Mountain. With good leadership and planning, the American militiamen had provided the American cause a critical victory at the time when it was most needed. King's Mountain invigorated the American forces in the Carolinas, setting them up for their equally stunning victory at Cowpens. Without those victories, it is hard to imagine an American triumph at Yorktown. General Sir Henry Clinton, noting the sequence of events, spoke of King's Mountain, calling it the first link of a chain of evils that followed each other in regular succession until at last ended in the total loss of America.